What I'm going to tell you is, is more of the future vision for TAC and, and how we are evolving organizationally and product-wise to get there. So it follows the themes that we'd, we've been talking about the past few years, continuous delivery. Uh, follow, follows on, um, you know, feature parity. So there's a lot we'll get into. We're headed toward a, a kind of a unification, a degree of unification among the services that we've just not been able to achieve. And it's because of all of you that that stuff like that becomes possible. Um, so we've we've couched the TAC 2030 strategy as in, allied information dominance. So it's not just about us. Um, and this is not like a pep talk on like JADC2, CJADC2, whatever else. Um, this is about what we're doing with TAC specifically so that it can be used in all these different uh, evolving CONOPS and missions. Um, and in case I didn't introduce myself, Ryan McLean, uh, I'm, I'm uh, the director of the TAC Product Center. At the TAC Product Center, we, we view ourselves, and I think this is an accurate, just kind of general statement, a true statement. We're the, we're, we're the U.S. government organization that innovates, sustains, and releases the TAC uh, family of products. We, we actually develop very few plugins. There's only a couple plugins uh, for which we're the release authority. Um, almost all of the 160 plus released plugins, 99%, uh, come from programs or, or industry um, or what have you. Uh, we're, we're a fully modern and agile software organization. We, we don't we, we really try to avoid committing to, you know, big targets to be delivered by a date under this budget. That's just, the, if, if, if you live in the modern software world, you know that that kind of approach tends to fail. So what we do is we focus on priorities, we focus on the needs of the community, we take in needs from program offices, prioritize those that come from the configuration steering board members, and then we execute on those. Our commitment to all of you every year is to deliver predictably on a timeline. So the, so the 120 day release cadence, that is very, very deliberate. Um, TAC comes out every 120 days, uh, ATAC first and the, the, the other products tend to trail that. That's very deliberate so that program offices that ultimately ship kit to users on a basis of issue have a predictable timeline. They know that their baseline is gonna change on, on some cadence. It's a really great relationship actually between the TAC Product Center and the Configuration Steering Board. Um, and, and so we don't, don't, put, don't put too much uh, faith in the, the infinity sign there. I think it's a good way to visualize that you know, we're kind of on the developmental side of the products, the uh, CSB, they're more on the ops side, fielding kits to operational users, uh, maintaining those and whatnot. What you're seeing play out at the TAC Product Center I think is very special to where we're accelerating, like over the past year, we have accelerated the pace of delivery of the tech products. Not in the sense of we can ship, you know, 50% more features than we did last year. Uh, features are really hard for users to, to ingest, actually. What we're focused on is, is, is reducing the feedback loop, the feedback cycles, uh, the time that it takes to complete a feedback cycle, and with that, the time it takes to deliver a product. So we've encouraged the CSB at large do what you can to be on the latest version of TAC so that as we're out here on the bleeding edge of the TAC products, you can give us feedback and we can incorporate that feedback. But it is a, it is a wonderful feedback loop between each of the CSB program offices uh, and the TAC product center where we're able to continuously improve our tooling so that we continuously improve the products. We'll get into that. So TAC.gov users, last year we were at about 15,000 TAC.gov users. Uh, now, we're, now we're over 30,000, we just hit that number. I think Charlie was actually sitting there clicking refresh at 28, 9,998, 29,999, because he sent me the screenshot at 30,001, and so we did it. We finally got to 30,000. Uh, um, so TAC platform developers, if you have a TAC.gov uh, developers account, uh, this, this includes you. Uh, this is access to GitLab, to the SDKs and all that. Uh, so there are over, over 8,000 accounts registered. Now again, that's not daily active users. Uh, that, that's, that's closer to you know, 1,000, 1,500, but still, that's, that's many people that, that are coming to this platform to build TAC. Um, and, and we think that's a, that's a great story to tell because it, it shows that not just the user side, or the download side of TAC is growing, but the, but the people that want to work in the plugin space or on, a, you know, on, on, on an exceptional basis, the core space is continuing to grow. So you're betting on the right horse. Um, we also have begun to track contractual data 
Uh, I think this should be a, a appealing and interesting to you if you're industry with us today. 2,500 total contracts uh, have, have been tied to, to TAC.gov users since we launched TAC.gov several years ago. Uh, today, there are over 880 active contracts. So if you've put in your contract data or sponsored someone, you know that we require you to put in period of performance start and end dates. Uh, there are over 880 plus active contracts with active POP uh, that, that are using TAC to deliver on some contractual requirement. So we looked at cost of these strategies, the national security strategy, national defense strategy, DOD zero trust strategy, uh, the DOD data strategy, the JATC2 strategy, uh, the DOD software modernization uh, mem memorandum, uh, which is actually a great memo if you haven't read it yet, uh, and then also the uh, FY23 NDAA. And uh, worked through those, decided where does TAC fit, uh, where do we wanna go with TAC and produce a strategy document. And it's, again, it's available on TAC.gov, publicly releasable. What I wanna show you is where our holes are right now. <laughs> We've got some major holes in TAC when we stack TAC up against these national strategies, specifically on zero trust and data. What do you do with your data that comes off the TAC devices after the mission ends? You flush it, right? Like, who? show of hands, who, who is sucking data off of their TAC end user devices, TAC servers, et cetera, and throwing them into some analytics engine? Who's doing that? Like, we're not doing it at Tech Product Center. Props to you, sir. I, really. Um, we, we aim, if you read the strategy, our aim here with the data and the DOD data strategy is, is not to become a data science organization. It's always going to be about delivering the tech products, making them better. But how can we provide tools that make the data that comes out of the tech products easier to learn from? How do you learn where people have been? Like, it, and there's going to be there's going to be tiers to this as well. We don't want to know at the Tech Product Center where all the PLI have been o over every you know GPS based timestamp. We want to know things like where, did, regardless of what the product is being used for, where did it crash? What plugins were loaded with it, et cetera. So where a lot of these tools exist in the client applications and the plumbing to get these logs to Tech Server and whatnot, we need to go those extra steps, provide sanitization that end users and, and operational units are comfortable with, we have to begin propagating that data about the runtime applications back up to Tech Product Center. That's where we start transforming to a data-driven software or engineering organization and not just a product house, but a data-driven engineering organization. We think there are a lot of applications for the tech data itself. In fact, AFRL is gonna make a substantial investment uh, in FY24 uh, to advance the the machine learning operations, the ML ops capabilities for TAC. Uh, envision in, in a year or two years, say closer to two years, you're going to start to be able to apply machine learning to the data that comes out of not just your EUDs, but whatever operational units EUDs that are comfortable sending vanilla sanitized runtime data uh, to the product center. Palantir does this today wonderfully. If, you, if you've used their Apollo platform to do continuous delivery configuration management, Palantir, I think, is, is kind of the gold standard for doing this. From high runtime to low telemetry analysis, they're doing this very well, and I think it's a great model for us to follow at Product Center. But this is the last slide. Where, where are we going, and, and what, are these, what are these themes going to produce? To win, and I, I mean that legitimately, to win, we have to, as a country, as a military, as a US government and our allies, we have to be able to frequently ship high quality technology at a faster pace than any adversary. We're just gonna control the TAC part of that and even just the TAC product center side of that. We're gonna work with the downstream production environments and the engineers that run those to make sure that TAC, not just the deployment side, getting it to the field faster, but the feedback side, we talked about the data piece, we want to make that loop as tight and as fast as possible in both directions.